and uh, I've been doing software development for quite a long time, uh, over 15 years by now. Currently part of an online grocery scale-up in the Netherlands called The Picnic. Um, you may have heard of it. If not, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, but if you're doing software development for quite a while, um, at some point I think you start to wonder about the nature of the job that we're doing. At least that's what I had. And maybe you recognize this. And that is why I want to talk about the art of software development. Because it goes beyond engineering, as we'll see in this talk. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. I first want to do a quick poll. So raise your hand if you are a software developer. Very good. If you're a manager, just keep your hand down. That's fine. No, keep your hand raised if you're a software developer. Very good. All right. Um, if you call yourself a software engineer, keep your hand raised. Ooh, a couple of hands going down. You're done now. Uh, but most hands stay up. Brave, right? Because being an engineer, it actually means something. And it means that you're part of a engineering tradition because engineering goes way, way beyond when we started calling ourselves software engineers, right? We had electrical engineers, chemical engineers, as we also saw in this keynote this morning, aviation engineers. So there's a long history of engineering that we put ourselves into when we call ourselves software engineers. But are we actually software engineers? Because when you think about it, these engineering disciplines that I mentioned, they're, they're similar, but they're also quite different from what we do. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time that you actually signed off on a piece of code that you wrote and you certified. We heard about certifications in the keynote this morning in the aviation engineering. That you certified that the code was bug free. Who? No one, right? No, really. That's what I thought. Um, me either. When was the last time that you were actually held liable for the code that you wrote? I know there's some pieces uh, of, uh, of our industry where we have safety critical systems, where there's lots of heavy processes, etc., that really start to look like real engineering. But I would say most of what we do is quite different from these engineering disciplines. So are we then actually software engineers, or is there more to this? And I'm not the only one who asked this question, by the way. There has been this headline, which has been doing the rounds a little bit in the past year, I believe, where Actually, in Canada, there's a regulator that told the companies there that they could not advertise anymore for hiring software engineers because, indeed, engineering is a protected title there, much like also in Germany. And they said, well, it's all very nice that you call yourself software engineers, but it actually means something to be an engineer. There's, there's rules, there's certifications, there's lots of things that are happening uh, to actually ensure things are going according to the law, even. And that is not something that is happening in the software space at the moment. So please don't call yourself engineer. All right, that's interesting because we love to call ourselves software engineers. So uh, sort of the whole internet was up in arms and big, dis big discussions around that. And that also prompted a little bit this talk and this, um, these thoughts I had around software engineering. Because if you read this article, um, it's actually pretty interesting what it says in there. It says professional engineers are held to high professional and ethical standards and work in the public interest, in a sense. The public places a high degree of trust in the profession, and these layers of accountability and transparency help keep Canadians safe. That's amazing, right? I want to be an engineer if I read this. But again, this was an article about how we cannot call ourselves engineers, because, well, apparently this does not apply to us. And I think we can also see a little bit why, right? Because compared to more traditional engineering disciplines, the way we approach software development is a bit more wild west, maybe. I don't know, what if we turn it around? And then what if we were to say maybe that a civil or mechanical engineer would work in the way a software engineer does? So let's imagine you're an engineer, a real engineer, and someone comes to you and says, let's build a bridge. Because let's face it, that's sort of the level of requirements that we get as software engineers as well. Um, and then uh, this, uh, this engineer says, of course, sure, I'll give you an MVP in two weeks, right? <laughs> no engineer ever, of course. But that's sort of how we try to roll, how we do our jobs. And of course, we all know where this will end up uh, in, in real engineering. It's, uh, we'll end up with a bridge that we don't want to cross, at least I don't want to cross. So in the end, um, that, that, that's not what the way we build bridges. That's not the way we do all of these traditional engineering and disciplines. And there's much more to that. But maybe we should try science, right? Because this is not uh, going to be it. And when you think about it, engineering is really indeed applied science. But wait a minute, 
we have science as well, right? We have computer science. Cool. And I love computer science, right? I studied computer science. I think a lot of you may have done this uh, as well. Um, and computer science is really about sort of the eternal truths. So we have data structures, algorithms, big O complexity, all very important. But is this really part of what we do as software developers day to day? I'm not really sure. So, like I mentioned, we, we have lots of stuff that we we use there. Um, data structures. Let's take uh, let's take uh, trees for example. We all know uh, trees. Uh, trees can't have cycles. Very important. Until bam, the product owner comes to you, <laughs> shows you this picture, and says, "Well, actually, trees can have cycles." No. What I mean to say is that, yes, there's a lot of things that we do use uh, from co computer science, but it's not really part of our software development day-to-day -day, uh, 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 cycle and things that we do. But maybe trees were the wrong example. Maybe we need to think about different concepts, right? So we also have uh, recursion. So we all know that to understand recursion, we first must understand recursion. But I'm going to assume that you're already there because otherwise we will not finish in time. So um, recursion, also a super important concept from computer science and uh, something that we may have a bit more real world use for than these uh, trees with the cycles. And indeed, uh, let's look at this one, right? So here's an article that says, Hitman hires Hitman, who hires Hitman, who hires Hitman, who hires Hitman, who tells police. It's got everything, right? It's got the suspense, it's got the drama, um, it's got recursion, it's got a base case, and the base case here actually is that the final Hitman says, well, <laughs> for this kind of money, I'm not going to do it, I'm just going to turn us all in. Uh, but anyway, uh, yes, we do see, uh, of course, computer science co concepts coming back in, in things that we do in our day-to-day -day jobs. But all in all, I would say it's a very small part of what we do uh, as software developers. Uh, software developers. So we do use a lot of output from co computer science. We use compilers, we use these data structures, um, but we're probably not doing fundamental research as part of our sprints, right? So we're not trying to prove P is MP or maybe P not as MP. I'm not sure what to root for these days. Uh, but anyway, if you think about computer science and us as software developers, I'm afraid the closest we often come is when we do for a new job and we have to do like lead codes, right? Anyway, so maybe we're not completely engineers, maybe we're not completely computer scientists, but what is it then that we do as software developers? Well, I think in the end, we're problem solvers. So it all starts with a problem in certain domains that we want to solve as software developers. And this can be anything, right? This can be e-commerce. This can be uh, building uh, accountancy software. This can be building games. Um, there's a huge range of domains that we want to write software for, and that's fine. And then we say to ourselves, okay, well then let's take all of these brilliant uh, computer science and software engineering principles, apply this to our domain, and then we get great software. Easy as that, right? Well, not completely, right? Because if this were the case, then we would not have projects that overrun, then we would have bug-free software, then we wouldn't have even very large companies like Google and Datadog and Atlassian having these huge auditors, etc. So apparently, there's more to this than just applying these principles and having a checklist and doing engineering and doing computer science. And this is where I believe where the art of software development lives. There's a certain art to making this all work, to actually taking this problem in the real world and writing great software that um, maybe we often don't really think about, don't want to think about because we want to view ourselves as engineers. We have it all down, we have it all figured out. But if we really think about it, this art of software development, it might be bigger than we give it credit for. So let's try to embrace it a little bit, okay? And congratulations, that means that you're an artist, at least partly. And when you think about it, it's, it's not a weird, right? Because what we're doing as software developers, we're actually creating stuff from nothing. We start with a blank slate, we have a problem that we want to solve, and we write some code, we iterate, etc., and magic happens. This is really cool, right? And it's so flexible, and we can change it in any way we want, which is both a blessing and a curse, I would say. It's a blessing because it will help us to do great things, cool things, and it's a curse because it's really hard to capture this in a solid engineering discipline where we know things will not go wrong, etc. Because there's just so many opportunities and possibilities. Fortunately, I'm not the only one who thinks about it this way. Um, here's this quote from John Romero, one of the uh, writers of uh, Doom. 
He says, you might not think that programmers are artists, but programming is an extremely creative profession. It's logic-based creativity. And I really love this term, logic-based creativity, because it really captures sort of the, the tension, but also the sort of combination of these two things, right? Highly logic-based, but also very creative. And of course, I'm sort of making an analogy here between software development and art, and all analogies break down at some points, and I'm sure we will find some counterexamples, but let's try to embrace it a little bit and see what we can learn if we think of software development also as an art, rather than just software engineering or just computer science. Of course, we don't always create new things from scratch, right? Some of us do practice the dark art of uh, copy-paste driven development every now and then, guilty as well. Uh, but in general, I would say we love our jobs because it allows us to create new things, to change the world. Like art can also drive change in the world, right? We really can make a difference by the problems that we're solving through software, which is great. And people may hear this and think, well, all right, you're making me a little bit sad, right? Because I'm an artist. It sounds like I'm, I'm an amateur, right? To which I say, really? Do you think that artists are amateurs? I completely disagree, right? So all of the things that we see around us, all the artists created, these people, they practice so hard, they live for their art. They actually get paid for their art, right? All of the work that we see in museums, lots of this is commissioned. Uh, I hope you also get paid for the code that you write. So that already makes you a professional, uh, in my opinion, at least. And it isn't as if art is only done by professionals, right? We also know uh, what happens if you mix art and amateurs. So um, I wouldn't say that art implies amateur. It is just a different way of viewing what we do. And I think it's a valuable one to take into account and to think about. So what is it then that we do? Now, if I were to describe our jobs in a single word, it would be the word abstraction. So like I said, we take a problem in the real world, we look at it, and we try to come up with something that solves it using software, using our insights. So let me take the example of Picnic, right? So we are an online grocery scale-up company in the Netherlands, and our goal is to make online grocery shopping as fun, easy, and affordable as possible for everyone here in the Netherlands, now also in Germany, and in France. And in order to do so, we need to write a lot of software, right? It looks so simple from the outside. As a customer, you just open the app, you place an order, and the next day, as if by magic, this cute electric vehicle arrives at your doorstep with all the groceries that you ordered. But of course, a lot of things need to happen in between. We have our own warehouses, we need to do our own scheduling, we need to buy all the groceries uh, from our side, um, need to do the picking, etc. So we need to create a ton of software for this. And that's essentially what we're doing as software developers, right? So we look at this problem and we try to see what is it that we need to automate, what are the essential parts of this problem that we can write software for, what are the accidental details that we can ignore, that we should ignore, and in that way, create the software and create this kind of art, right? Because in the end, our IDE, in this case, is our canvas, and the code we write is the paint that we use to create these systems. And we cannot just blindly uh, create software for everything that we see happening in the real world. There's a real step between this, and this step is not something that uh, can be easily captured in like hard and fast rules and, and check checklists and things that you can apply and then just magically get the good software out of this. That is where the real art of software development uh, happens. And when you think of it, um, this art of software development, it is applied not just to coding, but there's, there's several steps and there's several phases, of course. And we'll look at a few of these uh, in, in, uh, in this talk as well. So, of course, there's, there's the coding itself, the software development, but we also want to test our software. We also want to think about, okay, but do we need to do some kind of design, maybe, also, before we start coding? And there's a process around software development. Um, and these all together, they form what we do as developers. But let's start with the code, right? Because in the end, the code is truth. If you, you can have the best design, you can have the best process, but if you write uh, awful code and if you deliver awful software, then, then, you have nothing, then you have nothing to ship. So how does the art of software development work and apply in, uh, in, in, at the code level? So for this, I want to take this, this painting. We all know it, right? Mona Lisa, Leonardo da Vinci, widely regarded as one of the most beautiful paintings. So why do 
people think this is good, a good painting, a beautiful painting. Is it the haunting eyes? The elusive smile? The use of color? Yes, I think a lot of that. But you can also go a little bit deeper and see what principles have been applied by Leonardo da Vinci. And who knows this, by the way? It's the golden ratio, right? Yeah, exactly. So this is one of the things that you see coming back a lot in, in art that we find pleasing. And this golden ratio, this principle, it's not as if all art should apply. But when you look at a lot of very nice photographs, paintings, etc., you will see this coming back as a principle. So what are the principles of good code? Does it look something like this, maybe? <laughs> I know it's just something very aesthetically pleasing about uh, Ryu uh, sort of indenting uh, your code like this. Uh, but no, this is not really what I, uh, what I meant. Um, and by the way, I'm, I'm super happy that it was Java 21. We are getting Loom and we're being saved from callback hell and all these kind of things. Uh, but that's sort of besides the point. So I guess we should go for something not really as visual in terms of metaphor for, for good code and principles for good code. But let's stick with the formatting for a little bit, right? Um, because sometimes people do have very strong feelings about formatting of codes, what the code looks like. Um, I especially love this uh, submission to the International Obfuscated C Contest, which is actually a program that can run, looks super nice. But in the end, um, this is really not where we should get RC as developers. So software, source code, it's just a tool to run your intentions. Um, so I'm in a really big fan uh, of actually enforcing uniformity, and there's a lot of beauty in that as well. So if you're doing development, uh, you don't want to spend your uh, brain cycles on thinking about formatting of code or discussing this in pull requests, etc. Um, so we do a lot of Java development at Picnic. Pick one of these tools. Uh, we use Google Java formats, but there's a lot of uh, others as well. Just automate this away and, and don't bother anymore uh, thinking about it, right? Because in the end, the art of software development isn't really about placing new lines and curly braces, etc. It's about much more than that. Then what, what are these principles about? And let's go back again to modern design. Um, there's actually a reason why this picture exists, why this painting exists. And that is because there was this uh, fellow called uh, uh, Francesco del Giacondo, I believe, in Italy. Um, and he just wanted a pretty picture of his wife, as you do in these times. So he uh, commissioned this work to Leonardo da Vinci, and he started working on this, and he really put all of his his craft, his skill, his art, artfulness into this uh, painting, of course. But this painting didn't exist just because Leonardo, Leonardo wanted to practice his, uh, his golden ratio, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it really is something that, that had a purpose and had to be there uh, because he was uh, instructed to do so. Uh, by the way, um, Francesco never got this painting because uh, Leonardo showed it to a French king who outbid uh, Francesco uh, and <laughs> in the end, he didn't end up with the painting, so uh, I'm not saying this is advice to, to your code and uh, the way you uh, share your code, but just saying. Um, but there's a reason why this painting was that was there. And I think that's also the first principle that we should strive for uh, when we write any line of code. It should solve an actual problem, and it should solve it well. It sounds super obvious, but if you take this as a first principle, when you actually review pull requests, when you talk about code, when you look at code, then I think we can uh, also see that we sometimes, as developers, are prone to work on things that may, may not matter that much to actually solving the problem that we need to solve. So, first of all, good code is useful code, and code that solves a problem really well. But then there's also an orthogonal kind of consideration, which is what is the quality of this code? And of course, there's lots of opinions here, and that's great. Um, that is where we can differentiate ourselves as developers, right? So our code hopefully outlives um, our, our duration at a company or in a team. Um, so we should really strive to make its uh, quality as high as possible, to make it maintainable, extensible, also readable for others. So that's something that we want to strive for when we think about principles for, for good code. And finally, uh, context is king. If you're writing a game engine, um, your principles will be quite different than when you're writing a microservice in an enterprise environment. And there's many different contexts uh, that, that code can live in. So there's no single one, uh, one rule uh, to, to rule them all, let's say, if you think about what good code is. But it's really about context. And this is also a little bit applicable. I mean, 
no one really likes to the new guy coming into the team doing everything differently, right? And just because. So there's a certain art also to understanding your context and making sure that what you do as a developer fits into this context. But these are all pretty high level uh, and pretty um, yeah, hard to uh, action uh, principles. So especially the first one and the last one, they're really specific to the problem that you're solving, right? And the things that you do. So I cannot really help you with that, although it's very important to think about how you tackle this as a software developer. But let's zoom a little bit more in, um, in on this uh, quality. Because a lot has been written about code quality. You probably know at least one of these books around clean coding, beautiful, beautiful code, etc. And it shows at least that we as developers are very good in creating acronyms, um, <laughs> first of all. <laughs> Uh, you probably know uh, a lot of those, maybe not all of them. And there's a lot of wisdom in, in these books. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I think the true art of software development isn't really about only reading these books and just trying to apply these rules blindly, but knowing when and where and why to apply them. Because there's also a tension between some of these principles that are in here, right? If you want to keep it simple, sometimes you may need to duplicate a bit of code rather than to reuse to the maximum, which then violates the don't repeat yourself drive. So again, we're not blindly following uh, sort of a set of rules that have been dictated by some kind of engineering discipline here. Um, we're really figuring out when to apply what in what fashion as software developers. And of course, yes, do read these books, um, but then translate them to in, into your own context and use them to solve the problems that you have. So in general, I would say that looking at these principles and looking at everything that happens in your code, you want to find your style. And with your style, I don't mean your personal style, but something that you believe is good code for your team, for your company, for your product. And then engineer as much of this away as possible. What do you mean by that? Well, um, I always get pretty sad when I open a pull request and I see comments like this says, well, maybe can we add a space as after the if, right? And we talked about this, uh, formatting, waste of time to discuss, waste of time to expand effort on. And so uh, engineered as a way using one of the auto formatted tools, but also things about uh, API usage. Um, how about we use optional, but is empty instead of not optional is present, which is nice, right? Uh, but again, really not about uh, solving the problem that you have. And yes, it's great to have an opinion. It's great to be uh, uh, uniform and consistent here. But if you're uh, spending time on this over and over again on pull requests, it's just a drag on your process. So what do you want to do here? I think um, we need to make judicious use of tools. And not just tools for the tool's sake, um, but use them to actually solve these kind of issues that you encounter with your team in, in your company. And there's lots of tools like Spotbox and SonarCube and ArcUnit that can help you spot these kind of things automatically, which is already uh, one step ahead of what you would otherwise have with manual reviews and discussions on pull requests. But there's also a new and upcoming class of tools that will actually fix this for you and help you rewrite the code where you see these patterns that will also allow you to uh, express these kind of rules, inspect, et cetera, in your own uh, in your own way. And error prone is one of those. Uh, we use this heavily at Picnic. Open rewrite is another one. Um, and I really recommend looking into these kind of tools to, after you find your style, after you have all these discussions with your team, to actually engineer them away. So just to give you a taste of what this looks like, um, in error prone, this second pull request comment can be rewritten as, uh, can be expressed as a template um, where you express some uh, piece of before code where you say, whenever you see an optional where we call is empty and there's a negation in front of it, just rewrite it to optional is present. And we actually have this rule enabled in our CI, in our code base, and we have a very uh, uniform approach now to using optionals in Java. And there's a ton of other things that you can express here uh, that you never have to think about anymore. And you can have this discussion once, you may have it twice, but once you um, uh, arrive on a solution, once you arrive on what you find good code, um, then you should engineer the way using a tool, maybe like error but there are others as well. And just to give an, uh, another example, um, you can also write bug checkers to address the last one where, uh, where we are talking about API usage. So there's lots of APIs where if you don't supply a specific time zone, uh, for example, 
uh, then it will take the default one and that leads to all kinds of federal bugs and several issues. Um, so that is also something that you hopefully uh, run into once or twice and then you uh, engineer it away as much as possible. If you want to know more about this, um, there's also a talk uh, that we did around everything uh, that you saw on this slide uh, that is on, uh, on YouTube, uh, was from DevOps Belgium last year. Also happy to talk more about that. We have a booth over there, so swing by. Um, not the complete point of this uh, talk, but to bring it back to the art of software development, find your style and then as much as possible engineer it away. Because we should use our tools and not let our tools dictate us, right? Could you imagine, for example, what it would be like if painters were obsessing and discussing around brushes rather than creating paintings? Um, yeah, I think a little bit maybe. And in the end, it doesn't matter, right? And even if you have great technique and great tools, if you don't solve the right problem, if you don't create inspired work with it, then it's in vain. Then it doesn't help. And just to illustrate this, I'm going to take you back to 1885. Since Van Gogh was around at the time, um, Reddit, the oldest social media, was also around. No kidding. Um, and there's this subreddit called uh, Painting, and there's this guy called Tango, the one ear man. He says, hey guys, I need some advice on which brush to use for my next masterpiece. Any recommendations? Sure. Monet, the Water Lady King. Van Gogh, seriously, your paintings look like a chaotic mess. Fine brushes provide the finesse and control needed for true artistry. And notice how Van Gogh doesn't understand threading, but anyway, it's 1885, still early days. So we'll forgive him. Um, he says, yeah, I find fine brushes so boring. I like to use a fan brush to create interesting textures. And then along comes Renard, the colorist. He says, well, fan brushes are overrated and go. A filter brush is much better for blending colors. Yada, 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 and so on and so on. This is Finn versus Emacs, right? This is Taft versus Paces. This is needless discussion that we all love. This is the bike shedding that is happening every day on the internet. Uh, but in the end, it doesn't really help us. Um, Good craftsmen, they use their tools. They don't obsess about them, they don't blame them. It is about using the right tool for the right job. Notice how I don't say the best tool for the best job because that invites bike shedding. And using the right tool to actually solve the problem that you're having. So if you like this point, uh, I really highly recommend going to this boringtechnology.club website, uh, which will force you to reevaluate your life if you are doing resume driven development and jumping on new tools and new technologies all the time. Uh, and I know, I mean, it's, it's super enticing, and I also visit conferences and listen to talks about new technologies, but in the end, like I said in the beginning, we are problem solvers, and we're not solving any problems by keeping adopting new tools and obsessing over them. All right, that is all to say that in the end, yes, we should think about good cause, but in the end, our users don't care about our cause, right? They care about the value that we deliver to them, and yes, as artists, as software craftsmen, that we in turn should care about the quality of our code, because we know that in the end the quality of the code will also influence the way we can deliver and keep on delivering this. But keep this perspective in mind, and don't focus and obsess over the tools, but use them the way um, yeah, you want to use them with your, with your team, have these discussions, and, and use them purposefully, rather than just using them because you heard about it at a conference by a guy called Sander. So that's code. But there's more to software development than just coding, hopefully, at least. Um, so let's talk about testing. So testing, people often think testers and quality assurance is also a, or a little bit in the name. They should show that the software works, right? Well, not quite, because that is sort of impossible. Um, actually, testers, they try to break shit, right? Um, in the end, as a, as, a, as a tester, it's your job to, to find the flaws, to find the problems. Um, and I really like uh, testers and QA people who are good at this, especially if they're doing exploratory testing, um, just randomly messing around in, the, in, a, in an application, trying to find issues, etc. And you always see these big smiles, of course, when they break something, which is nice, right? And then they sort of take a screenshot, uh, well, maybe kind of different, but uh, anyway, they, they, they report this and you get to fix this uh, and, and life is good. But as we are a group of developers here, um, we're probably not too much into the exploratory, exploratory testing side of things. So I want to talk about unit tests. And much like we can talk about what is 
good code, we can also talk about what are good unit tests and how, how much of engineering and how much of an art is there to it. So I hope that we can all agree that a unit test has a basic structure that each unit test should adhere to. So this is the arrange, act, assured kind of uh, um, uh, setup that we all hopefully all know. But of course, then come the details. And yes, we, we must assert something in a test for a test to be useful. But should a test only have a single assert? May it have multiple? Well, at least it should have more than zero. So that's something that we, uh, that we know for sure. And there again is sort of the discussion that you should have with the team, with the company. What do we think is a good test, right? And do we use the plain J unit assertions or do we use assert J or another uh, library to do very elaborate uh, um, uh, assertions, etc.? These are all good discussions to have, but have them once or twice and then engineer it away. And all of the tooling and all of the things that I mentioned before can help in assuring these kind of things. But as we go up the sort of ladder of abstraction in uh, unit testing, things become less clear cut and less um, amenable to engineering away, I would say. Because in the end, we also want our test to drive the design of our code. At least if you're on the, in the TDD camp, and if you believe that tests are valuable to write not just after the fact, but also maybe during or even before you uh, write your code. Um, so, and for this, um, yeah, I, I don't think there's any automated checks that we can write. Because you will have to answer questions like, is this test actually maybe even over-constraining my solution, right? Because we might worry about not testing enough, but you can also test too much. And not enough, too much, already sounds very vague. Uh, and indeed, this is something that's, that, that takes a true artist to recognize what, where you are in the skill. Have we covered enough with the test? We all know code coverage, of course, but we also know that 100% code coverage doesn't really need to mean anything uh, if you don't have all your assertions in place, etc. So there's, a, there's more of an art twist than that. And as we go up um, at the start of a unit test, setting things up, um, in the end, we also want our tests to be understandable, uh, maintainable, extensible, serve maybe even as documentation for new people uh, joining the team. So then you get to questions like, should we do mocking in our unit tests? And how much? And when? And when not? Should we share data between uh, unit tests? Because otherwise it might become tedious and repetitive, but if you start sharing, then it becomes more fragile. So there's many, many trade-offs here that are, uh, I would say, very much part of the art of software development. These are things that you cannot automate away, um, but that you should have good discussions on with your teammates, that you should actually maybe practice or at least be reflective about when you look at your own code and when you look at other people's code. So that is something um, where we see that, yes, there's definitely part engineering here, but there's also a large part of our craft, our art of software development shining through also in tests. Which brings me to uh, design. And I'm not talking about UX design, uh, I'm talking about software design. You could also call it software architecture. Um, and the question a lot of people have is, do we even need this stuff, right? Because, well, we're agile now, we just write the code, we test it, if it's not right, then we'll change it. Um, and it's a good question, I mean, uh, there's definitely maybe uh, sort of a history in our field there, uh, which I might call software architecture arts. Um, I present to you uh, late 20th century, early 21st century uh, software architecture art, uh, easily recognizable box and arrow style. Um, I know, right? So there's just maybe a bit of a negative connotation to software architecture and the ivory tower kind of thing, thinking that uh, may have happened in some organizations. But does that mean that we should just ignore it and do away with the design and then just do our thing as developers and start coding? Um, and actually, we're not the first to ask this question. We're actually quite late to ask this question. Uh, Martin Fala also asked the same question in 2004, even, uh, with the rise of Agile and XP at that point. And uh, he wrote an essay called, Is Design Dead? And spoiler alert, uh, his answer is no, um, which is also my answer, right? So we still need to ensure that we build the right thing the right way. And we cannot just get our in two weeks sprints writing only code. So if we do software design, if we do software architecture, we allow ourselves to avoid costly mistakes that take a lot of effort, time, money to fix at a later stage. It also helps us think more 
about the risks and the assumptions around features, around things that we're building, about technology that we're using. Uh, and, and last, it also forces us to document much more about what we do. Yes, of course, code is its own documentation, etc., etc. I've heard all the arguments, but it's so helpful if you have a new onboarder joining your team and you can point them to uh, documentation around the design of your system, right? Just some diagrams, some explanations, etc. So there's a lot of value still in doing design. Doesn't mean that we actually need architects or a role of uh, architects. I think, and I firmly believe that every senior developer should be able to do software design and software architecture and create this kind of documentation and do these kind of trade-offs. But it's still there. And it's not something that we should ignore or don't talk about. So it means that it needs to find a place also in your sprints, in your cycles. There needs to be time for this because it will not happen automatically. And as a wise man once said, um, weeks of coding can save you hours of designing. And let's turn it around, of course. We want to do some design to prevent weeks of wasteful coding. Now, there's uh, a talk last year at DevOps Poland um, by Simon Brown called Build Boss Art of Software Design. Well, you can see how I like the title. Um, but it's actually a fantastic talk. It goes much deeper on this uh, topic. I would highly recommend checking it out if you want to uh, go deeper on this, if you want to uh, get better at this, and also uh, find the tools with your team to do this. Because I would say that software design, it is more creative and more daunting than actually writing the code, right? Because you don't have a compiler that yells at you if you're doing something wrong. You have to make trade-offs yourself, and the feedback loop might be measured in weeks or months rather than minutes or hours, right? And in the end, there are a lot of trade-offs here. Sometimes um, it is completely unclear what the best route is. You might need to do some PLCs. You might need to look at what kind of data you need to gather as, as an architect, as a designer, to actually make these decisions. And you really need to understand the problem that you're solving to be able to, order to design software. And last, but certainly not least, design is really about communication. And communication involves people, and people are hard. Right? So that is definitely something uh, that we as software developers should get better at. And in the end, I think there's a driving force uh, behind software design that we should also keep in mind, which is simplify. And you may know this quote by uh, Pascal. He said, if I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. Right? So if we translate this to software architecture or software design, um, it would say something like, if I only had more time, I would have created a simpler architecture. Said no software developer ever, of course, right? <laughs> because we love complexity and somehow we're drawn to uh, complexity and, and drawn to elaborate setups and, and new technologies and advanced things. So I want to give you at least one sort of pointer in this uh, direction. And that has to do with simplification and thinking maybe differently about software design. So, actually, I found this really interesting article in Nature, and it showed that we, as people in general, favor solving problems by adding stuff rather than removing it. So they had this experiment where people had to create a stable structure out of this, uh, this, uh, this Lego uh, tower, and all, almost all participants said, okay, let's just add three more blocks at the uh, edges, and you have a stable construction. Cool, problem solved. Whereas it would be much easier to just take one block away and have a stable structure, right? And I think the same applies also in software architecture, architecture and software design. We are very much prone to just keep on bolting stuff on and keep on adding stuff and not really thinking about the bigger picture and what it is that we can maybe combine, uh, abstract, or take away to make our designs better. So, if you're designing software, try to think more like a sculptor and try to chip away unnecessary parts until you're left with something, a design, an architecture that solves a problem that you want to solve. So perfection is achieved when there's nothing left to take away, in this case applies. Great quote. And the, the tip here is to, to think more about what it is that you can leave out, what it is that you can simplify, what it is that you can take away, rather than keep on adding new things. Harder, uh, easier said than done, by the way. Finally, as I said, design architecture 
it's also very much about communication. So there's another art that we can learn from that is super helpful when you're doing this. Because in the end, you need to bring along your team, right? Maybe your managers, maybe the rest of your company. So you need to be able to tell the story of what it is that you're trying to achieve with your design. And storytelling is a, an art discipline that's very much about this. It's about bringing structure to your story. It's about capturing this creativity and bringing it in such a way that it's engaging, that it's convincing to other people, that you can communi communicate complex ideas in a simple fashion and also visualize your story. And when you think about it, that is exactly what we need when we're writing design documents, when we're writing RFCs or architecture decision records, or whatever it is that you do within your company to document and uh, visualize your architecture. Of course, that still requires a story to tell. And for that, we still have our trusted old domain-driven design approach, the somewhat newer event summary approach to actually uncover the story of your domain, uncover the things that you're trying to address with your um, uh, designs and your architecture. Um, but in the end, like I said, it is not just about the things that you think up, but it's also about how you communicate it, how you do it. So how do you get better at this? For code, we have something called code katas, which are small exercises to get better at solving problems. There's lead code, there's, also, there's just, uh, the advent of code. There's lots of things where we can get better at coding in small. But how do you get better at design? Um, that's a question that I have for a long time. And actually, within Picnic, uh, a couple of months ago, I launched a workshop around this whole topic, so for architecture, design, RFC writing. And one of the biggest part of this workshop is that people actually get to write, in our case, we work with RFCs, so get to write an RFC for a fictional feature and that I thought up for this uh, workshop. And they do this in groups. And you wouldn't know how interesting it is to compare these documents that come out of that and how much you learn about various approaches, trade-offs, etc. when you do this. When you do this deliberate practice, you take a couple of hours together um, to learn and to, to practice this. So I highly recommend doing this also within your own company if you don't do so yet. Because this stuff is hard, right? Like I mentioned, there's no compiler, there's no uh, tooling to help us here. It is really about thinking of solutions and communicating solutions that you need to get better at when you think about software design. All right. So we've had codes, we've had testing, we have software design. There's also this thing called process around creating software, which we, of course, all love, right? Is it done yet? The dreaded question. Um, and interestingly, some people think that software development process is sort of a solved problem. There's even ISO standards around uh, systems and software engineering. Sounds very fancy. You can even buy this. Uh, I didn't. Uh, I read the introduction. Spoiler alert. It's not great. I uh, wouldn't recommend. Um, but all, all to say, there's, there's sort of an illusion of control going on in some of the software development uh, uh, things, software development processes that we see. Um, and I think a lot of us have suffered from that and have swung the other way, right? So. Agile is also what we use at Picnic, what a lot of companies, probably most companies use. And it's actually nature's way of telling us that software development isn't strictly engineering, that there's a lot of inherent uncertainty, complexity, um, art to doing what we do. So we just take it incrementally, step by step. And that is fine. There's different gradations, I would say, of, of doing Agile and doing Scrum, right? So there's so the very ad hoc way, you get a message over Slack, you implement it, and then the product manager thinks of something differently, you get another message, so you get this sort of spec by Slack kind of approach. Um, wouldn't recommend. And then there's also on the other side, Scrum fall, right, where people say they're doing Scrum, but in the end, this is very much still a waterfall with quarterly, yearly planning, and all these kind of uh, things that are putting it uh, very, very... Uh, tightly in there, where we all know that things are going to change. And I know you're now all expecting me to come up with some kind of interesting insight from art to how to do a process better. Uh, sorry, don't really have it. Um, there, there, there's no silver bullets in this, uh, in this, in this case. Um, what I can do is I can turn this a little bit around, right? So rather than thinking and focusing on process, maybe we should think more about our teams and the way we work and the way we work together. And what do we mean by that? Well, there's a few things that we can do as software developers that will help us deliver great software. And the first thing is 
I want to encourage you to be really explicit in the expectations that you set for yourself, that you set for the people around you, that you set towards the teams around you, um, and do so with empathy. So put yourself in the shoes of the others as well. And that already sounds like very logical, basic human decency, etc., which it is, but sometimes this gets lost. Um, and if we start doing this, then this will also lead to teams getting more autonomy, because we always talk about how we want to be autonomous, we want to make our own decisions, stand on our own feet, which is fine, but it means that you need to earn trust. And to earn trust, you must also give trust to the people around you. So what I want to say is that, yes, process, um, there's one dimension where we have everything hammered down in this ISO standards, isn't going to work. There's the other way where we say, okay, just leave it up uh, to, to whatever happens on, on Slack, um, also not going to work. Just focus on your team dynamics. Focus on the way you want to work together with your teammates. And especially if you come into this, into this sort of continuous learning loop with your team, with your people around you, when you foster curiosity, um, it, will create, it will create an atmosphere, it will create a team that actually loves to, to, to deliver new features, loves to deliver new uh, software. So I want to say that the great, great teams, they can evolve good processes or at least survive bad ones. But the other way around, um, you're stuck, right? You can have a great process, but if this doesn't happen in your team, um, then you won't deliver a great software anyway. So if you were to read any book, um, don't read books about Scrum, don't read books about process, read, read this book, people were. Um, in the end, developing software, performing the art of software development, it's very much a people endeavor. So we need to get good at these things to be able to either survive a bad process or to evolve good processes from within. So, then the next question might become, that's all very nice. Um, you've shown a lot of things that we should care about as part of the art of software development. But how do we learn this stuff? How, how do people actually absorb this kind of um, yeah, thinking and in, in, in how do they get better as software developers? Is this like just experience? You just need to be there to, to learn it and then hope that you, you catch it? Um, well, maybe, but I think a lot of us turn this question into how do I get the right knowledge? So how, who has these books, by the way, on their shelves? Yeah, there's a few hands. Uh, me too. Um, I, I'm not afraid to admit that I have uh, read only a small part of this, but even if you were to read it cover to cover and, and you come out of uh, your computer science study, uh, you are still not a software developer yet, right? Um, there's, as we saw, much more to software development than computer science and everything involved in here. And you might want to turn this question a little bit more around and say, how do we get the right skills? And is that something that we can do through books? Now, I'm Dutch, um, so I know how to ride a bike. I also know that you do not learn this from a book. Apparently, people do, because it is actually a real book. I thought it was a gimmick. I was this close to buying it, but I uh, didn't. Super curious what's in there. Like, does it say just get on and pedal, don't stop, don't fall? I don't know. Um, but we all know that, that you don't learn riding a bicycle from, from this book, right? And then you say, okay, maybe we need something more rigorous. Uh, okay, to which I give you uh, this article by Bartosz Chichanowski 15k words on the engineering of bicycles. Why does it work? Everything is in there, all the forces, all the influences. Super fascinating, but again, you will not be able to ride a single meter on your bike after reading this, even though you will be much smarter. I uh, highly recommend us checking out this article. Uh, great animations, great uh, everything. So, we're missing something here. And I think the missing part is uh, what is also sometimes referred to as meters. And it's a, it's a Greek word, word that actually refers to a combination of wisdom, skill, and craft. And it's very intangible, of course. I found this, uh, this term, by the way, in a book called Seeing Like a State, which is absolutely not about software development, but it's a great book anyway. Um, and it, it talks about Metis. It says, Metis uh, it resists simplification into deductive principles, which can be successfully transmitted to book, through book learning. Because the environments in which it is exercised are so complex and non-repeatable that formal procedures are impossible to apply. Well, it sounds a lot like what is happening also in software development, I would say. Yes, complex, non-repeatable environments. That is definitely what we uh, run into. So how do you acquire meetings, wisdom, skill, craft? I think 
we should also go back to how the great masters actually acquired their art and their skills. And they very much did this in sort of a master and apprentice relationship, right? Where they learned from other masters. They formed guilds. And I know a lot of companies currently nowadays also form guilds, and we do share a bit of knowledge there, which is nice, it's a great start. But I think we should go farther there as a software, software uh, industry. You also see this in this article that a lot of students are also turning away, maybe more from formal learning, more towards these kind of apprenticeships. Uh, apprenticeships. Um, so there's definitely something there. And at Picnic, uh, to give an example, we also did this. So what we de developed is what we call our tech academy, where we take people right out of university and we understand that they will not be great developers from the start because of all the reasons that we talked about. But we also want to get them there fast. So in the Tech Academy, we do place them in a team from day one, where they participate, where they actually pick up work already, but they also get roughly half of their time to develop their meters, their skills, their crafts. And we do this by assigning them a dedicated mentor. So this is very much the master-apprentice kind of relation that we, uh, that we saw previously. Um, which is also supplemented by, of course, some formal learning. So we do have some courses. We give them access to a lot of books, uh, online courses, etc. But it's this combination of personal attention and personal relation, apprenticeship kind of approach that helps us bring people up to speed in the art of software development. So I'm not saying that this is 100% foolproof and everyone should do it, but it seems to work for us. We've run a couple of groups like this, and I think it's a very good way to get people up to speed quickly in the art of software development. So what I would say is that what you can do, as you see it here, is to either find a mentor or be a mentor, depending on where you are and what you want to achieve. And being a mentor, this can be inside your company, but it can also be broader than that, right? So there's also communities, there's, there's user groups, Java user groups, there's these kind of conferences. There's all kinds of opportunities where we can share our trade, our craft with other people around us. And I think that is something that is very fulfilling, that will also really help advance the art of software development. Now, as we know, real artists leave a legacy, right? So what I want to challenge you is to think about what you're working on. This is actually matters to you, because in the end, that determines also how much you put of yourself into it, right? And sometimes you need a little bit of a wake-up call. So if you need that, let this be your wake-up call, and really think about is the company I'm working with, is the project I'm working on, is it actually something I care about and something that I feel that will leave a legacy, that will shape the world, that will actually show my art of software development in an appropriate way. Looking at this legacy, um, you can have all the great tools that you want, but it's really about finding the purpose, finding the style with your team, engineering hopefully a lot of parts away, but still it's something that uh, yeah, it, it takes craft, it takes meters, as we talked about, to get good at this. And if you want to actually make a mark and leave a legacy, then mentoring, as I talked about, is a great way to do so. We love to talk about these 10x developers, right? And maybe you secretly want to become one. I think that's, that's wrong. I think we should strive instead to, throughout our career, bring 10 people around us 10% farther than they are. And if you do that, then you're a 10x developer. And uh, yeah, maybe let's hope that we get some recognition for the work that we do uh, before we die, unlike some of the uh, big artists that we talked about in this, uh, in this presentation. But I think we should be good there. Now, I want to wrap up. So if this resonated with you and you want to know how we do the art of software engineering at Picnic, please check out our engineering blog there or even better, come work with us. We have lots of cool stuff to do. We have very big ambitions. But for now, I want to close and say, go forth and write some beautiful clothes.